I'm going to present to you a brief history of forensics. Keep in mind this presentation represents highlights and is by no means an exhaustive list. All people represented have relied on work of those before them. History often has a habit of remembering those who speak out loudest, while the worthwhile work of the more modest minds often is forgotten. Archimedes in around 200 BC invented a method of water displacement to find the volume of King Hero II's votive crown. By determining the density of the crown, it was determined that the goldsmith had substituted silver for some of the gold. At least that is the long-standing story. Is it real, or is it a myth? Something of this scale, only for that to sink on its maiden voyage. Well, let's just say that failure wouldn't have been a pleasant option for Archimedes. So he took on the problem. Will it sink? Perhaps he was sitting in the bathhouse one day, wondering how a heavy bathtub can float, when inspiration came to him. An object partially immersed in a fluid is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. In other words, if a 2,000-ton Syracusia displaced exactly 2,000 tons of water, it would just barely float. If it displaced 4,000 tons of water, it would float with no problem. Of course, if it only displaced 1,000 tons of water, well, Chiron wouldn't be too happy. This is the law of buoyancy, and engineers still call it Archimedes' principle. It explains why a steel supertanker can float as easily as a wooden rowboat, or a bathtub. If the weight of water displaced by the vessel below the keel is equivalent to the vessel's weight, whatever is above the keel will remain afloat above the waterline. This sounds a lot like another story involving Archimedes and a bathtub, and it's possible that's because they're actually the same story, twisted by the vagaries of history. The classical story of Archimedes' Eureka and subsequent streak through the streets centers around a crown, or corona, in Latin. At the core of the Syracusia story is a keel, or coronae, in Greek. Could one have been mixed up for the other? We may never know. On the day the Syracusia arrived in Egypt on its first and only voyage, we can only imagine how residents of Alexandria thronged the harbor to marvel at the arrival of this majestic floating castle. This extraordinary vessel was the Titanic of the ancient world. Except without the sinking, thanks to our pal Archimedes. In 44 BC, Julius Caesar was killed in front of hundreds of witnesses near the Senate in Rome. A group of Roman senators led by Brutus and Cassius violently plunged their blades into him resulting in 23 stab wounds. Roman physician Antistius performed an autopsy and found that of the 23 wounds, none were fatal except the second wound in the breast. Was he right? The crime, which took place more than 2,000 years ago, serves as a lesson to criminologists, historians, and even doctors to learn from it as part of the evolution of forensic science and medical discovery. That autopsy report was possibly the first recorded application of medical knowledge to a homicide investigation, and also the first record in history of a pathologist giving an opinion as an expert witness. This gave rise to the term forensic in Latin, which means before the forum, which is where Antistius delivered his opinion. In the 5th century, Germanic and Slavic societies were believed to be the first to put down in statute that medical experts should be employed to determine the cause of death. In 1248, His Guan Yu, also known as Song Chi, wrote in The Washing Away of Wrongs or Collected Cases of Injustice Rectified, perhaps the first book of forensics. It offers some advice that is still useful today, including tips on identifying cases of strangulation from damaged neck cartilage. In this book, there there's a quote, a forensic medical doctor must be serious, conscientious, and highly responsible, and must personally examine each dead body or that of a wounded person. The particulars of each case must be recorded in the doctor's own handwriting. No one else is allowed to write this autopsy report. A coroner must not avoid performing an autopsy because he detests the stench of corpses. A coroner must refrain from sitting comfortably behind a curtain of incense that masks the stench. 
let his subordinates do the autopsy unsupervised, or a petty official to write his autopsy report, leaving all the inaccuracies unchecked and uncorrected. He also said, should there be any inaccuracy in an autopsy report, injustice would remain with the deceased as well as the living. A wrongful death sentence without justice may claim one or more ad additional lives, which would in turn result in feuds and revenges, prolonging the tragedy. In order to avoid any miscarriage of justice, the coroner must immediately examine the case personally. In the washing away of wrongs, the first documented forensic entomology case is reported. In 1235 AD, the stabbing occurred in a Chinese village. By testing different blades on animal carcasses, it was determined that the wound was caused by a sickle. After further questioning, the investigator had all the villagers bring their sickles and lay them out before the crowd. Blowflies were attracted to a single sickle because invisible remnants of blood and tissue still adhered to it. The owner of the alleged sickle later broke down and confessed the crime. In other areas of the text, the author demonstrates knowledge of blowfly activity on bodies relative to those orifices infested, the time of infestation, and the effect of trauma on attractiveness of tissue to such insects. In 16th century Europe, medical practitioners in army and university settings began to gather information on cause and manner of death. Ambrose Parr, a French army surgeon, systematically studied the effects of violent death on internal organs. Two Italian surgeons, Fortunato Fidelis and Paolo Zaccia, laid the foundation of modern pathology by studying changes which occur in the structure of the body as a result of disease. In the late 1700s, writings on these topics began to appear. These included a treatise on forensic medicine and public health by the French physician Fod and the complete system of police medicine by the German medical expert Johann Peter Franck. Fortunatus Fidelis, an Italian doctor, is regarded as the first person to practice modern forensic medicine way back in 1598. Later, in the 19th century, forensic medicine became a recognized branch of medicine. In 1806, German chemist Valentin Ross developed a method to detect poison in the walls of victims' stomachs. One of the great unsung heroes of crime detection was James Marsh, who eventually held the post of ordnance chemist at the Royal Arsenal in Woolwich, southeast London, during the 1830s. In 1829, he had worked as Faraday's assistant and apparently showed a great deal of promise. It was a few years after this, in 1832, that Marsh was called to test a powder found in the organs of George Bodle, an 80-year-old man with a vast fortune. The prosecution believed the powder was responsible for his death. One day, Bodle, a normally vigorous man for his age, fell ill after drinking his morning coffee. He began having stomach cramps, vomiting, and subsequently died. The local justice of the peace, Mr. Slace, began to investigate the matter. It was noted that Mr. Bodle was not popular with his family and prone to fits of violence. There were rumors that the grandson, John, wanted him dead. Slaced asked Marsh to check the contents of the stomach and coffee in order to establish whether or not arsenic was used. Marsh used Shields' test, which quickly revealed the presence of arsenic in the coffee. Likewise, the stomach contents gave the same positive result. A local chemist testified that he had sold John Bodle arsenic trioxide. A maid overheard that John wanted his grandfather dead, for his inheritance. All of this led to what should have been an open and shut case. However, at the trial in 1832, he was surprisingly found not guilty. Part of the reason for this was that samples of arsenic trisulfide that Marsh had recovered using the shield method had deteriorated by the time of the trial. Marsh, devastated at this result, resolved that he would pick up where shield left off. He wanted to develop an infallible test for arsenic that would be easy for the lay jury to understand. In the apparatus shown, the sample is added to a solution of hydrochloric acid and zinc in the flask to the left. If arsenic is present, arsine gas would form and travel along the tube at the top. If this is ignited using the flame to the right, a unique silvery black stain would form on a porcelain plate if held at the end of the tube. This test proved so sensitive that quantities as small as one-fifth of a milligram could be detected. Many years later, far too late in fact, John Bodle, who had been deported to the colonies for fraud, admitted to murdering his grandfather. 
Spaniard Matthew Orfila, a chemistry teacher in Paris, publishes Traite de Poison or Toxicologie Générale. The book is the first scientific study of how to detect poisons, and it earns Orfila the title Father of Forensic Toxicology. In France in 1840, a 24-year-old woman named Mary Lafarge was chanced, uh, charged with poisoning her husband. She had been seen buying arsenic to kill her rats, and it was also rumored that she was unhappy with her marriage. Lawyers on both sides were arguing, and the methods scientists used to prove that Lafarge had killed her husband kept being doubted or disproved, as we saw with the Marsh case. Both sides agreed to consult Matthew Orfila. Orfila took samples from the husband's body and the soil that he was buried in. Orfila found traces of arsenic in the body and proved that it did not come from the surrounding soil, making the jury decide that Lafarge was guilty and she was sentenced to life in jail. In 1835, Henry Goddard of Scotland Yard was the first to use bullet comparison to catch a murderer based on a visible flaw in the bullet, which could be traced back to the mold. In 1843, police in Belgium beginning, begin keeping files of daguerreotypes to help catch criminals. Over the next decades, the use of photography as a forensic aid booms. By the 1850s, police in France and the U.S. are also using mug shots. Rudolf Virchow, a German physician, anthropologist, pathologist, prehistorian, biologist, writer, editor, and politician, was fluent in German, Latin, Greek, Hebrew, English, Arabic, French, Italian, and Dutch. He was the first to describe leukemia as a blood cancer. Virchow coined the term embolism and thrombosis for the blood clotting mechanism. Modern autopsy techniques still employ many of his methods. He was a forefather in the area of pathological anatomy and founded cellular pathology. He also promoted that the cell was the basic unit of the body and it had to be studied to understand disease. The first reported use of forensic human hair comparison was by Virchow in 1861. He reported the following. The greatest majority of the hairs of the victim represent a thorough and complete accord with the hairs found on the defendant, that there exists no technical ground opposite to looking at the hairs found on the defendant as being the hairs of the victim. However, the hairs found on the defendant do not possess any so pronounced peculiarities or individualities that no one with certainty has the right to assert that they must have originated from the head of the victim. Frenchman Alphonse Bertillon was the first to apply statistical methods to the identification of people. In 1879, he begins working on an elaborate system of measurements called anthropometry, which include length of right ear, circumference and breadth of the head, lengths of arms, legs, and fingers. His system is used widely to identify criminals. His reasoning was that no two humans have exactly the same measurements. He also devised an easy-to-use index card system for the data. His ideas were met with derision for years, mostly due to ignorance on the part of his superior. After his superior retired, his replacement put a challenge to Alphonse that if he could use his methods to identify at least one habitual criminal in three months, that he would consider using them to solve cases. He was near the end of the third month of tireless efforts that he finally made a breakthrough. A suspect was presented to him who gave his name as Dupont. His face seemed familiar, and he was found to have a mole near his left eyebrow. Bertillon put his system into action and took the necessary measurements and started flicking through his index cards. After matching the measurements with those uh, on one of his cards, Bertillon declared that the suspect in custody was in fact a man called Martin, who had been arrested in December 1882 for stealing bottles. At first, Martin denied his identity, but confessed after he was presented with Bertillon's evidence. In 1887, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle published the first Sherlock Holmes story, Study in Scarlet. Holmes is the first scientific detective. Conan Doyle himself was a scientist and a trained physician. In The Adventure of the Copper Beaches, he writes, I am glad of all the details, whether they seem to you to be relevant or not. 
Conan Doyle's use of reasoning backwards illustrated his use of scientific method in case solving. In The Brass Elephant, he writes, As you may know, no two human fingerprints are ever alike. Holmes first used fingerprints in his 1890 book, The Sign of the Four, which was 11 years before Scotland Yard began using fingerprints in detection. In The Valley of Fear, he writes, But what is the use of a cipher message without the cipher? He used cryptology in many other works. Many of his cipher techniques were applied during the World Wars to decipher messages from the enemy. In The Hounds of the Baskervilles, a dialogue goes, Holmes? Footprints? Watson? Yes, footprints. Holmes? A man's or a woman's? Watson? Mr. Holmes? They were the footprints of a giant hound. In 29 of his 60 stories, footprints were used in a large variety of settings. In fact, in one of the books, Holmes authored an educational treatise on the preservation of footprints. The techniques, including using plaster of Paris, described in the work, have become mainstay in police departments worldwide. In The Norwood Builder, Holmes uses handwriting analysis to determine that a will was written aboard a train, a highly unusual circumstance. In 1879, while investigating a burglary in Tokyo, the Japanese police recovered a set of grubby fingerprints on a whitewashed wall. A man was later arrested on suspicion of the crime, but vehemently protested his innocence. The police had heard of a Scottish surgeon, Dr. Henry Falds, who, while working in Japan, had published the first scholarly work on patterns in fingerprints, so they approached him for help. Falds took the suspect's fingerprints and compared them with those left at the scene. They did not match, and the man was set free. A few days later, another suspect was arrested, who was a match, and he quickly confessed to the crime. Falds published this case in the journal Nature. When he returned to the UK in 1886 and presented the applicability of fingerprint analysis to the Metropolitan Police, he was summarily dismissed. He then proceeded to talk to anyone who he thought would listen. Charles Darwin was interested, but felt too old and ill to get involved. Darwin passed the information to his cousin, Francis Galton, a sportsman, explorer, meteorologist, and psychologist. He was also a firm proponent of the Bertillon system, having lectured on the subject himself. He did foresee, however, that fingerprints could prove as an easier method of identification. At this time, he merely forwarded Fall's communication to the Anthropological Society of London. He did come back to the subject later, but consulted Fall's competitor in the field, William Herschel, who was the first to have used fingerprinting in a formalized system. Herschel handed all of his material over to Galton, who then developed a proper system of classification and ident identification that is still used to this day. Francis Galton published, published uh, Fingerprints, which provides the first statistical evidence for the uniqueness of human fingerprints. After reading the treatise, the Home Secretary, later Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, establishes a committee to determine whether fingerprinting or the Bertillon system are to be adopted. In Argentina, in 1892, Galton's fingerprint techniques are used to, by officer Juan Vucetich to solve a murder committed by a mother of her children after clearing her two lovers, who were initially suspects. Hans Gross, an Austrian professor and judge, publishes Handbuch für Untersuchung Richter, the Manual for Examining Magistrates, a handbook of forensic investigation. Although Gross likely never read the Holmes stories, his real-life work seems Holmesian in his sophistication. He is also credited with coining the word criminalistics. This groundbreaking book laid out why examining evidence under a microscope could be a vital step in solving crime. As this was the first book to combine the two fields of microscopy and criminal investigation, Hans Gross is considered by many to be the father of criminalistics. His book also involved psychology, fingerprinting, dust and hair analysis, wood fibers, and other trace evidence in science as instruments of forensics. In Gross's words, a large part of a criminalist's work is nothing more than a battle against lies. He has to discover the truth and must fight the lie. He meets the lie at every step. 
In one case, he used as an example from the old record of a criminal with great cunning. A young man was believed to have burned down the house of a farmer. The young man was the prime suspect for the crime, as it was widely known that he resented the farmer and used to work at the mill opposite the farmer's home. However, having left this occupation nine months previously, he was nowhere near the farmhouse at the time of the incident. On examining the scene, investigating officers found evidence that while still employed at the mill, the young man had constructed a device to set fire to the farmer's home at a later time. First, he had stretched a strong spring and cord across a skylight in the granary that faced the house. Securing the spring with pitch, he had then arranged the flammable material and a magnifying glass under the cord. Nine months later, under the ideal conditions, this ignited the cord, which snapped, causing flaming pitch to catapult from the skylight onto the farmer's house. In 1912, Gross later founded the Institute of Criminalistics as part of the University of Graz Law School, the first of what was to be many of such institutes opening up all over the world. George Pop, originally a chemist, did have some training in the use of microscopic techniques from his work in laboratories. In 1889, he founded his own laboratory, the Institute of Forensic Chemistry and Microscopy, which dealt with the toxicological scientific analysis for the purpose of criminal investigations. In 1904, a young woman named Eva Dish was found dead in a bean field in Frankfurt. The post-mortem examination showed that she had been raped, then strangled to death with a scarf. A stained handkerchief had been found at the scene. Pop examined it under a microscope and found nasal mucus containing traces of coal, snuff, and the mineral hornblende. Using this evidence, a man by the name of Karl Laubach soon became the prime suspect. He was known to use snuff and worked in a coal-burning gas works, as well as part-time in a local gravel pit that contained a large amount of hornblende. Pop examined Laubach's fingernails and found coal and grains of minerals, including hornblende, underneath them. On examination of Laubach's trousers, he found further evidence, two layers of soil. Soil samples from the lower sample, directly in contact with the cloth, contained minerals that matched those taken from the crime scene. The upper layer contained particles of crushed mica mineral, which matched soil samples taken from the path from the murder scene to Laubach's home. Once confronted with the evidence, Laubach confessed. Frankfurt newspaper the next day carried the headline, the microscope was detective, in homage to Pop's work. Pop was sought in many cases for his ability to microscopically analyze samples and become the preeminent forensic geologist of the time. In 1901, while researching blood cells, the University of Vienna professor, Dr. Karl Landsteiner, discovers that cells fall into different groups. These groups are eventually labeled as types A, B, a, B, and O. Leon Latz, a professor at the Institute of Forensic Medicine in Turin, was the first to develop an, an antibody test for A, B, O blood groups, which was first used in court in 1916. He introduced forensic paternity, that is the identification of relatives to a corpse based on blood. In 1915, Latz develops a method for pinpointing blood types from dried blood. With this technique, Latz goes on to exonerate an accused murderer by testing blood stains on his coat. He published the first book dealing with hereditability, paternity, and the typing of dried stains. In 1901, Karl Lundsteiner discovered that centuries of attempted blood transfusions had failed because practitioners had overlooked one simple factor, that blood falls into distinct groups. The Viennese pathologist discovered different types of protein and sugar markers, known as antigens, on the surface of people's red blood cells. He realized that blood transfusions between people with different types of antigens failed because the body's immune system would attack the foreign red blood cells. For example, if a person with antigen A on their blood cells is given a transfusion of antigen B blood cells, antibodies in their blood plasma will destroy the donated blood cells, triggering a dangerous reaction. In 1902, Lundsteiner classified human blood into the now well-known A, B, AB, and O groups, allowing safe blood transfusion on a mass scale. Today, 
around 107 million units of blood donations are collected globally every year, demonstrating the huge impact of Lundsteiner's discovery. In 1930, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine. Characteristic of his energetic and hard-working nature, Lundsteiner died pipette in hand in June 1943, after suffering a heart attack in his laboratory at the Rockefeller Institute in New York. In the early 20th century, Frenchman Edmond Locard sets up a forensic lab in Lyon. A disciple of both Gross and Holmes, Locard is fascinated by what he calls the problem of dust, how to use trace evidence to solve crimes. He proposes a concept known as Locard's Exchange Principle, which states that whenever a criminal comes into contact with a victim, an object, or a crime scene, he or she will leave behind evidence and will also take away evidence. This principle is the cornerstone of forensics. His seven-volume work, Traité de Criminalistique, proved to be of great help in many investigations. He was founder of the Institute of Criminalistics at the University of Lyon. Nineteen twelve, Lyon, France. Young socialite Marie Latell gazes into the vanity at her parents' home. When an intruder sneaks up behind her. The next morning, she's discovered, strangled to death. Police call in a man by the name of Dr. Edmund Locard, who had, in 1910, established one of the first police laboratories in the world. Locard examines the body of Marie Littell. He determines the time of death to be at midnight. When he looked very closely, he could see tiny scrape marks around those bruises. And he concluded from this that the assailant had dug his fingers so deeply into her neck that he must have scratched the outer layer of the skin and probably took some tissue with him. Police consider possible suspects, and one rises to the top of the list almost immediately. Marie's boyfriend, Emile Gorbin. But his alibi places him far away, since Locard determined the time of death was at midnight, and his friends swear that Gorbin was with them at that time, playing poker. And the police believe very strongly his friends were telling the truth. But Locard isn't so sure. He asks to examine Gorbin's fingernails. Locard still thinks Gorbin may be the killer. He performs a series of tests on the sample. As Locard digs deeper into the dust from beneath Gorbin's nails, he uncovers an amazing amount of detail. The sample contains reddish iron oxide pigment known as Venetian red. It looked very much to him like the kind of Venetian red that chemists use to make ladies' makeup. Locard consults with Marie's chemist. And the chemist was able to identify this definitely. This was definitely the specimen that he had made. In order to get all these microscopic ingredients under his fingernails, Gorbat must have scraped them across skin that wore this specific face powder. Locard concludes that Gorbat must have strangled Marie. So they confront Gorbat again and he sticks to his story. Police don't intend to let him off the hook. They confront him with Locard's findings and insist that he must be the killer. And he finally tells police how he staged his alibi. Gorbin set up what appeared to be the perfect alibi by tricking the young men who'd been playing cards with him. He did this by setting the clock ahead so that it appeared to be one o'clock when it was actually midnight, which gave him time to travel to Marie's home, commit the crime without his friends realizing that the hour was wrong. And Gorbin would have gotten away with it had he not carried away trace evidence that an experienced scientist could detect. 
1910, Albert Osborne publishes Questioned Documents, a classic in handwriting analysis. Osborne goes on to become the greatest handwriting expert of the early 20th century. Born in 1858 on a farm near Grass Lake, Michigan, Mr. Osborne was the second of six children. In Grass Lake, he did the usual farm labor and attended the nearby country school. Farm life did not appeal to him, so he attended the state college at Lansing, where he became interested in the art of penmanship. With sufficient training and practice, he felt he could become a teacher of penmanship. In the summer of 1882, he received a letter from the Rochester Business Institute offering him a position as a teacher of penmanship. It was from this early beginning as a teacher of handwriting that Mr. Osborne extended his interests to the identification of handwriting, typewriting, paper, ink, and to the many questions that arise concerning contested documents. In those early days, attorneys often consulted a local penmanship teacher to obtain opinions as to the genuineness or spuriousness of a signature. As soon as Mr. Osborne became uh, established as a highly qualified teacher, lawyers began submitting question document problems to him. By 1920, his business had grown to such proportions that he moved from Rochester to New York City, where he opened an office and began devoting his entire time to question document work. He, more than any other document examiner who preceded him, was responsible for placing question document work on a scientific basis. So extensive was this influence that the name Osborne has become legendary throughout the world among handwriting experts, lawyers, judges, investigators, and all who deal with question document cases. Recall Henry Goddard was the first to use ballistics matching in a court of law in 1835. In the 1920s, using microscopes, U.S. Army Colonel Dr. Calvin Goddard, no relation, perfects the technique for identifying markings left on bullets by the gun from which they were shot, using a comparison microscope. During the 20s, Calvin Goddard and Philip Gravel were busy perfecting the comparison microscope. This is a binocular device where each eyepiece views a different area through a separate microscope. Goddard and Gravel modified the setup so that bullets or shells could be compared side by side. It was a revolution in the science of ballistics. In 1925, Goddard and Gravel teamed up with a gentleman named Charles Waite, who had been compiling a database of ballistics information on hundreds of weapons. They established the now legendary Bureau of Forensics Ballistics in New York. They offered their services to police forces around the country, specializing not only in ballistics, but also in fingerprinting, blood typing, and trace evidence analysis. Probably the Bureau's most famous case took place on Valentine's Day, 1929. On that day, at a garage situated at 2122 North Clark Street in Chicago, two men dressed as police officers lined six members of George Bugs Moran's gang up against the wall. Two other men joined them, both wearing trench coats and carrying Thompson submachine guns. They then proceeded to fire 70 rounds into the men's of, uh, line of men, killing some instantly and gravely wounding others. Just over a year after these events, two Thompson submachine guns were recovered from the home of a known hitman called Far Frank Burke, who had been rest, uh, arrested on suspicion of murdering a police officer in Michigan. Goddard found a match between test bullets fired from these guns to the St. Valentine's Massacre bullets. In the afternoon of April 15, 1920, a factory paymaster and his bodyguard were shot to death in South Braintree, Massachusetts. As the paymaster and his guard were leaving the factory where they worked, they were ambushed by two bandits. One of the attackers pulled a gun and fired into the guard while the paymaster was gunned down as he turned to run. The paymaster had been carrying two metal boxes containing $16,000 in cash. After the shootings, the killers climbed into a car that had pulled up to the scene with three men in it. When the getaway car drove off, the shooters were gone, and so was the money. The guard had been shot four times and the paymaster twice. Four empty cartridge cases were found on the scene near the guard's body, and all six bullets had been fired from a 32 caliber automatic pistol. Five had been fired from a gun with right-hand rifling, and one from a barrel with left-hand spirals. Of the four bullets in the guard, the fatal bullet marked by the police with the Roman numeral three had gone through the victim's right lung, tore open his pulmonary artery, and came to rest at his hip bone. This slug, referred to as the fatal bullet number three, had been slightly flattened, but was suitable for analysis and comparison. Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti 
would be tried for the murder of the guard, and bullet number three would play a vital role at their trial. On May 5, 1920, when Sacco and Vanzetti were picked up for questioning, both were carrying 32 caliber automatic handguns. Sacco's gun had left-hand rifling, and Vanzetti's had the opposite. At the time of his arrest, Sacco was employed in a shoe factory. He told the police he possessed the gun because of his second job as a security guard. Vanzetti was a fish peddler who said he needed his gun to protect his cash proceeds. Both men were active in Italian anarchist groups and were considered by the police to be radicals. Seven years after the murder and robbery of the paymaster and security guard, the Sacco Vanzetti case was still in the news. The execution date postponed several times because of the flood of worldwide protest, was approaching fast. On June 1, 1927, Massachusetts Governor John Fuller appointed a committee of, th of three men to look into the case. On June 3rd, three days after the creation of the Lowell Committee by Governor Fuller, he offered his services to the defense. That is Goddard. Without referring to Sacco or Vanzetti's guilt or innocence, Goddard said he would make tests to determine if the fatal bullet had been fired from Sacco's gun. The defense team, to which Goddard had first offered his services, was not interested whatsoever. The prosecution, however, welcomed Goddard's assistance. The examination took place on June 3, 1927, in the office of the clerk of the courts in Dedham, with one of the defense experts, August Gill, present. Gill had never seen a comparison microscope, but quickly realized its usefulness as an aid in comparing bullets and shell casings. Also present were four newspaper reporters and a stenographer. Goddard first compared the four empty cartridges found at the scene with a test shell that had been fired in Sacco's gun. He concluded that the third crime scene shell he examined was identical in its markings to the test cartridge. Goddard was certain that the two shells had been fired in the same weapon. The firing pin imprints were exactly alike, and the markings made by the breech lock were identical. Goddard then examined the four bullets from the body of the murdered guard. The comparison microscope revealed beyond question that the fatal bullet 3 had been fired from Sacco's gun. The rifling glues were the same depth, width, and rate of pitch. In addition, there appeared tiny longitudinal scratches that matched perfectly. Rotating the bullets, Goddard lined up and compared each brew. He then invited the defense expert to look into the microscope. Augustus Gill agreed, that bullet, he said, referring to the fatal bullet number 3, could not have come from any other gun. In the 1920s, a young newly appointed Federal Bureau of Investigation director named J. Edgar Hoover recognized the importance of scientific analysis in criminal matters. He encouraged the Bureau to remain abreast of scientific advancements and use them where appropriate. In 1930, the Bureau established a criminology library and began collecting and publishing uniformed crime statistics. Bureau agents in training attended lectures on such subjects as fingerprint comparison, handwriting comparison, and ballistics. But at the time, the Bureau did not have its own laboratory or scientific staff. Outside experts were hired on a case-by-case -case basis. This approach was neither efficient nor cost-effective. On July 7, 1932, in a memorandum to Hoover, Special Agent Charles Apple proposed a separate division within the Bureau to handle so-called crime prevention work and to oversee a criminological research. Hoover shared and supported this vision, which has served as a cornerstone for the FBI's work throughout its history. In September of 1932, the birth of his vision was realized when an ultraviolet light machine, a microscope, a moulage kit, a wiretapping kit, photographic supplies, chemicals, a drawing board, and other office equipment and supplies were moved into room 802 of the old Southern Railway building at 13th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest. Washington, D.C. Initially named the Criminology Library Laboratory, its official birth date was established as November 24, 1932. In its first year of operation, the laboratory performed 963 examinations.
it is housing now not only the world-class technologies that we performed in a J. Edgar Hoover building, but it's also housing the world-class scientists uh, that perform that work. So uh, we're able now uh, to, to perform our test in the best facility possible, uh, under the best conditions possible. I think it's the, uh, the heart and soul of the employees in this building that should erase uh, any signs of controversy. We've got a world-class facility here, no doubt, but more importantly, we have world-class scientists performing the test, and that's what uh, uh, this work is all about. We're not out uh, in this building to prove theories. We're out here to provide truth, to provide that truth to prosecutors or to the defense. That's what this laboratory is all about. Dr. Samuel Shepard's wife, Marilyn, was found dead, uh, beaten to death in their home on July 4th, 1954. Shepard explained he had fallen asleep in the sitting room, only to be aroused some time later, believing he heard his wife call his name. He dashed upstairs and saw someone grappling with her. He was knocked out by a blow to the head, and upon regaining consciousness, he was confronted with the blood-stained body of his wife. He gave chase after hearing noises downstairs. He woke up later on the shores of Lake Erie with his feet in the water and his t-shirt missing. There were several inconsistencies with Dr. Shepard's story, and after they became aware he was having an affair, charged him. And on December 21, 1954, he was convicted of second-degree murder. This was far from the end of the matter. The defense attorney contact contacted Dr. Paul Leland Kirk, an esteemed criminalist who specialized in microscopy and was appointed the leader of UC Berkeley's criminology program in 1937. He agreed to examine the evidence. He focused on recreating the crime scene based on patterns of blood in the bedroom. The prosecution had claimed the murder had been committed by a medical instrument based on sketchy evidence. Kirk, on the other hand, concluded that the blood spatter was almost certainly caused by a heavy object such as a flashlight, not a surgical instrument. Based on the amount of blood at the scene, it was also hard to believe that none of it ended up on Dr. Shepard. Kirk also examined that the killer must have held a murder weapon in his left hand, but Shepard was right-handed. Even with the new evidence, it took nine years to get a retrial, and the new defense attorney, F. Lee Bailey, coupled with Kirk's work, gained Dr. Shepard his freedom in 1966. You may find it interesting that this case was the motivation for the te television show, and later the movie, called The Fugitive. Since the advent of DNA testing in 1985, biological material, that is skin, hair, blood, and other bodily fluids, has emerged as the most reliable physical evidence at a crime scene, particularly those involving sexual assaults. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, contains the complex genetic blueprint that distinguishes each person. Forensic testing can determine if distinctive patterns in the genetic material found at a crime scene matches the DNA in a potential perpetrator with better than 99% accuracy. In 1987, Florida rapist Tommy Lee Andrews became the first person in the U.S. to be convicted as a result of DNA evidence. He was sentenced to 22 years behind bars. The next year, a Virginia killer dubbed the Southside Strangler was sentenced to death after DNA linked him to several rapes and murders around Richmond. DNA is also responsible for snaring Gary Ridgway, the infamous Green River Killer of Washington State, responsible for a string of murders around Seattle in the 80s and 90s. 
After being implicated by genetic testing, Ridgway pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 48 consecutive life sentences. Law enforcement agencies around the world are assembling DNA databases, which have yielded matches that investigators may otherwise have missed. The FBI now has DNA records on more than 5 million convicted offenders, and sex offenders in all 50 states are required to submit DNA samples to law enforcement. The case of Colin Pitchfork was the first murder conviction based on DNA profiling evidence. There was a previous rape conviction based on this type of evidence we discussed earlier. After going missing, Linda Mann, a 15-year-old schoolgirl, was raped and murdered in the grounds of Carlton Hayes Psychiatric Hospital in Narborough, Leicestershire, in November 1983. Forensic examination of semen samples showed that it was a type found in only 10% of men and was from someone with A-type blood. However, the police did not find a, subs- a suspect. In 1986, another 15-year-old schoolgirl, Don Ashworth, was similarly sexually assaulted and strangled in the nearby village of Enderby, and semen samples showed the same blood type. Richard Buckland, a local 17-year-old with learning disabilities who worked at Carlton Hayes Psychiatric Hospital, had been spotted near Don Ashworth's murder scene and knew unreleased details about the body. In 1986, he confessed to Don Ashworth's murder, but not Linda Mann's. Using Sir Alec Jeffrey's new technique, scientists compared the semen samples with a blood sample from Richard Buckland. This proved that both girls were murdered by the same man and also proved that this man was not Richard Buckland, the first person to be exonerated using DNA. In 1987, in the first ever mass DNA screening, the police and forensic scientists screened blood and saliva samples from 4,000 men aged between 17 and 34 who lived in the villages of Enderby, Narborough, and nearby Littlethorpe, and did not have an alibi for murders. The turnout rate was 98%, but the screen did not find any matches to the semen samples. The police and scientists expanded the screen to men with an alibi, but still did not find a match. In 1987, August, a woman overheard a colleague, Ian Kelly, boasting that he had given a sample posing as a friend of his, Colin Pitchfork. Pitchfork had persuaded Kelly to take the test as he claimed he had already given a sample for a friend who, was, who had a flashing conviction. The police arrested Colin Pitchfork in September 1987, and scientists found that his DNA profile matched that of the murderer. Colin Pitchfork had previous convictions for flashing as well, and claimed that the murders had begun as flashings, but the girls had run away, which had excited him. In January 1988, Colin Pitchfork was sentenced to life in prison, for the murders and was told he had to serve a minimum of 30 years. The announcement that um, I am this year's recipient of the Copley Award, Copley Medal, of the Royal Society of London. And, well, my reaction is, wow. (laughs) So, let me explain. The Copley Medal, I I need to do my research, this is all too new, but it was established in the, I think, early-ish 18th century, and is now the oldest and most prestigious science award in Britain by really quite a long way. Um, So for me to receive it was fantastic. Why did I receive it? Well, I was delighted. It wasn't just for DNA fingerprinting. So I think the citation was um, awarded for its contributions to fundamental research into human genome diversity and instability or something like that. So the award captures basically my whole career, including the DNA fingerprinting bit of it. And I was so pleased about that because people tend to forget I've done stuff before DNA fingerprinting and stuff after DNA fingerprinting. If you look at the roll call of previous recipients of the Copley Medal, uh, it is absolutely jaw-droppingly awesome. So um, there's Michael Faraday. There's uh, Davy, Humphrey Davy of the Davies Lamb. There is uh, Joseph Lister. There, Charles Darwin. And of course, the Lester associated Alfred Russell Wallace as well, also involved in developing the theory of evolution. Einstein, Rutherford. I mean, it's just all the great names in science are there. So to be included in that roll call is beyond my wildest conceivable dreams. It's fantastic. I would like to conclude for you by reading from 
the first reference listed, Silent Witnesses, the Often Gruesome but Always Fascinating History of Forensic Science, is by Nigel McCreary. In examining the history of forensic science, it is inevitable that we are forced to confront the darker side of human nature. We look at these brutal crimes and we say to ourselves in disbelief, how could anybody do that? I cannot disagree. It is impossible not to look at such acts and see evil. But I hope that through explaining the complex and painstaking methods by which these crimes are solved, this book has also demonstrated that forensic sciences instantiates much of what is best in humanity, ingenuity, determination, and above all, a belief in justice.